see we have kind of a very packed agenda, so I might have to keep some of our illustrious speakers on time for introducing this second. Uh, this is a very good prompt that the meeting is going to be recorded, so if you enjoy it so much the first time and you want to re-watch it, feel free. It will be hosted on the South London Cardiovascular Net Net uh, Network's website, the link of which is in the emails um, that you have been sent already and will be resent after the event, but also feel free to share it with colleagues and others that you think might be of interest of it too. So if I quickly cover over the agenda and then I'll cover any uh, points. So next slide, please, Elsie. Um, as you see, packed agenda, as I said, so we're going to cover the uh, referral pathways of both centres um, that exist for the Southeast Vascular Network, which um, is Mr. Michael Dialanis's network, and then the Southwest Vascular Network, which is run by Professor Peter Holt. We'll then cover the uh, abdominal aneurysm screening programme, which is led by Professor Ian Loftus. We will then look at pre-assessment and physio with uh, the vascular CNS Liz Anderson from St George's and the vascular physio Matt Fuller from St Thomas's. Then we will look at decisions not to treat and medical decision making and the work of uh, the great team of POPs by Judith Partridge at St Thomas's. And then I look at post-surgery uh, with Peter Holt and then Matt Fuller again. Um, and then there'll be a QA. and a um, on the Q&A point, so you will note there's a chat function, which I'm going to put in if these are your questions here. If you have questions as we go through, to not to interrupt the flow, if you could put, put your questions in the chat indicating who it's for, and we'll get to it in the Q&A section and, and do a bit of a round robin. If somebody already asks a question you wanted to ask, if you could like it or put a thumbs up to it, and then I can get an indication if there's lots of questions, which are the most popular and we can cover those first. Any questions we can't cover, we'll ask the speakers to kind of give a short written answer and send it in our blurb. At the end, you're going to be asked to do a feedback form. The feedback form link will be on the chat. If you do the feedback form, then I can email you a certificate of attendance. Um, unfortunately, my first ever GP event, I just sent a certificate of attendance to anyone that signed up um, because the register wasn't complete and I got told off. So you have to complete the feedback form before I can send you a certificate. They were very clear about that one rule. So without further ado, um, and I don't think I've missed anything, I uh, would like to do one thing before the end, which is to thank Elsie Griffin, who's in the South London Cardiovascular Network team, um, who will be doing all the background slide moving that has really pulled all together all the slides and all the meeting invites and the promotion of this event. And without her, it wouldn't have really happened. So I always think we leave thank yous to the end and they get rushed through. So just a big thank you from myself, um, but also all the clinicians and the team here that will be presenting. And then finally, a big thank you for you to giving up your evening to uh, listen to us talk. OK, so over to Mr. Dialamas. Hello, good afternoon. <clears throat> thank you very much for coming. Um, I want to talk to you about um, the obviously the theme today is aneurysm. So I really want to talk to you about where to send them and what we would like to um, what the expectations are from the primary care. So if you look at the map, we have two carefully positioned um, networks, one is the southeast and the southwest. These cover a very wide area um, and uh, essentially would be these are the two major centers that will do all the aneurysms from from the area. The very specific referral pathways that Professor Loftus is going to talk to you about and, and the specific guidelines as to who to refer where. I'm just going to give you give you this map uh, as I think gives you an outline where all the preferred hospitals are and then we're going to talk specifically about each network. Um, there are two uh, arterial centres are the St George's St George Centre for the Southwest and St Thomas's Hospital at, um, at Westminster for the South East. Um, the rest of the hospitals do have, uh, they do not have, most of them don't have an arterial, they are non-arterial centres and do not have facility to operate on those um, uh, aneurysms, but they do have some facilities in investigating and doing outpatient clinics as well as follow-ups. So next slide please, Elsie. So if you look at the population at the South East, there are two major uh, hospitals, the Guy St Thomas's and King's College. Um, King's College Hospital is uh, mainly known for his diabetic foot nerve, was also carotid work. All the, all the um, major arterial work and aneurysm is, uh, is happening at St Thomas's, which is very well populated, as you can see from consultants. It's about uh, 13 of us, and we have a, a very well equipped hybrid theatre and lots of facilities to operate. We have lists, try two lists every week, every day of the week, and a very comprehensive on call rota will covers all um, uh, all spectrum or all, all spectrum of aortic disease. 
So um, when the patients come in, there's always uh, uh, the infrastructure to treat them appropriately at any time of the day, including weekends. The next slide, please. Looking at the rest of the um, network hospital, we have Princess Royal University, um, and you can see the consultants that uh, currently help us with doing the clinics locally and provide the inpatient uh, service is actually quite important. Um, Princess Royal University College, um, sorry, University Hospital, U Lucia, Queen Elizabeth in Woolwich, and then Queen Mary Sidcup, which is an outpatient setup, and Miss Sanford is doing an outstanding work with doing uh, diabetic foot work as well as um, outpatient clinics. If you move, move on to the rest of the hospitals, uh, Darren Valley Hospital, which is the um, my non arterial centre, the, the place I do an outpatient clinics, we have three consultants serving there, as well as Tunbridge Wells. I have two consultants there. Um, there is some, the only different with, uh, you can see with Tunbridge Wells is, Tunbridge Wells also is a hospital that owns Maidstone. However, Maidstone is only covered by Medway, which is a different arterial centre to us. So that's the only, um, only difference, only bizarre thing we have in our network. If you go to the next slide, LC. So again, St George's, um, another um, very big hospital with um, very well equipped, um, has a number of hospitals that uh, they um, that they serve: Ashford, St Peter's, Kingston, Epsom. Let's go to the next one. Again, uh, Queen. I think we skipped one back. I'll say Queen Mary, Scroydon, Isarin, St Helier. So it's a quite well, quite wide area, and all these um, hospitals do have consultant vascular surgeons that attend not necessarily every day, but they attend the key days of the week that provide inpatient and outpatient service. They all receive your referrals, so they will all um, um, deal with them uh, locally up to a point that it's appropriate, and then refer them to the um, major centre for um, an operation or, or if there is any specialist um, investigation or opinions are needed. Again, this is a, a wider um, view of the area and you can see where how the area is split up. There are, there are some areas that sometimes um, can be, um, they are based on both both sides and again it's up to the GP's um, um, discretion as to where to they want to refer them. So the message is please do refer your patients to the appropriate local hospital where, where they will see um, a consultant from the arterial centre and then the problem will be resolved either locally or um, or at the major centre. You do not need to refer people directly to St Thomas's or to St George's. Um, the way we have organised the network is um, that <clears throat> all the facilities are local, so patient journey will be facilitated. Uh, to the local hospital only, and the only trouble they have to make is if they want to go for an operation at the hub. Next slide, please. So what do you do? You have um, um, an aneurysm. Well, it depends. If you do have uh, an um, acutely symptomatic AAA, something which is uh, tender or you wear it, it has ruptured, and be aware that ruptures can present in a number of ways that don't always present, as, as the books say, with um, patient collapsing and dropping blood pressure. They can present when explained back pain, and some of it may be mistaken quite often for a renal colic. And we did have a near misses um, in the past, luckily less now as people's knowledge is expanding. If you do have some, somebody who has either known aneurysm or an unknown aneurysm, you suspect has ruptured is, is significantly tender, then the correct way of communicating with us will be to directly call. For the Southeast Vascular Network, the on-call vascular registrar, which is on call for 24 hours, um, has a mobile phone that is uh, the one you can see on the screen, or it can communicate via the sw via switchboard. Um, then your regist registrar will take the call and then we'll um, process it appropriately. There is a, a specific protocol for ruptures that we have implemented that uh, um, um, essentially communicates with everybody who's involved in the patient's care and we can get a team very quickly on board to treat uh, with a case. Similarly at the southwest um, you, there's a blip or, um, or by switchboard again uh, communicate with the surgical registrar and the surgical registrar will again trigger the rupture AAA or emergency protocol for AAAs. If you go to the next slide. So what you do if you have something which is not um, small enough, but not but big enough for you to worry, something which is about above the threshold, which is 5.5 centimeters in most cases now, which is six or seven. Well, 
In that case, if the patient is asymptomatic, this is, this is an incidental finding, or this is a known aneurysm that you've been follow up, following up, and uh, you found in a recent scan that his has grown more than you expected, the easiest way to do it is to, re to use the referral patient uh, software. The referral patient is actually a very valuable tool that we've in implemented recently and allows us to um, log every single fall and concern people have, at the same time reply to them in a timely manner. The reason all the with Anderson Thomas is, is that even though we um, expect that uh, replies to be less than 24 hours, actually significantly less. So it has enabled us to communicate with the, with, um, the referring physician in a much easier and quicker way. Um, the registrar on call the consult will be, will be uh, notified about the referral as soon as you send it. And then reading your um, referral, um, the referral, they will be able to call back or ask more clarification needed or act appropriately. For aneurysms of that size, we will tend to streamline them through um, a process of rescanning, get the correct scan if they don't have it already to um, discuss the aneurysm size and again the anatomy and then streamline them to uh, our medical team like uh, our Dr. Partridge will explain to assess them medically and then see them in outpatient clinic to discuss options of management who would be an operation or, um, or not if the patient wishes. Um, if anything is on below six centimeters, um, that can be referred through ERS directly. And again, the referral should be made to the aortic team for each um, um, from your local, to, if referred directly to your local hospital, and then it will be picked up from there. For small aneurysms, um, again, um, the uh, depending depending upon the, the size again depends upon the, the age of the patient if you have somebody who's an octogenarian with a three centimeter aorta again it was it's worthwhile sending a referral to us so we can clarify with the patient and again discuss expectations from this it's very likely for somebody who's an advanced age with a very small aneurysm there will not be any follow-ups or if there is if there is a follow-up then it would be um it would be clarified by us I think I'm done for this. Yes, you are. Thank you very much. Shall I move straight on? Yes, please. So thank you, Michael. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, just a little run through of the aneurysm screening program, which I hope many people are aware of. Uh, next slide, please. So the whole point of screening for aneurysms is to try and pick up people before they rupture. There's some, sorry, rather graphic images of what aneurysm ruptures represent. The cartoon is what patients imagine might happen. The scan and the actual picture of what really happens. Next slide, please. Um, however much we've improved care, um, aneurysm rupture is still pretty dire. So the outcomes for patients are dismal. Um, 70 to 80 percent of people who have a rupture aneurysm die despite our best efforts. So we run a screening program using ultrasound as shown here to try and detect aneurysms before they get to a size where there is a risk of rupture. And that gives us the opportunity to either monitor them or treat them early and again prevent that rupture. And this is using these portable ultrasound machines run in community settings. Some may be in your own practices. Um, we're always looking for new practices if you're interested in helping us with this. Next slide, please. And if we can pick up aneurysms before they rupture, we can treat them in two ways, either with open surgery to replace that aneurysm with a graft, which is sewn into the aorta, or with stents, which is a much more common approach now, um, much less invasive and uh, has very good outcomes. Next slide, please. So the National Aneurysm Screening Programme uh, is one of the 11, the 11 NHS programmes. It started just over 11 years ago now and essentially comprises a program whereby every man in his the year of his 65th birthday is invited to a single ultrasound screening, uh, usually in a GP setting, um, but there are some um, different settings we do this. And to put it in context, our cohort for this year for the whole of South London is just over 16,000 men. Um, there are many reasons why it's restricted to this cohort. So aneurysms are much less common in women, um, they're much less common in younger people, but other people, particularly older men, can self-invite themselves to a screening program. So men who have been left out for one reason or another or didn't want to attend when they were originally invited can still self-invite, and I'll come back to touch on that. But it's quite a big program, so 16,000 men per year. 
Next slide, please. And what happens? Well, we do the scan. It takes 10 minutes. It's very easy, painless. Um, and if the aorta looks normal on ultrasound, we'll reassure the man and send them away. If their aorta is bigger than three centimeters, depending on the size, we'll either put them into an annual surveillance program or a three monthly ultrasound surveillance, or if they're over 5.5 centimeters, as Michael's alluded to, that's the size where we consider surgery and we'll refer to the local aortic center. And we have very strict timelines if people have aneurysms of that size, size of two weeks to appointment and eight weeks to surgery. It's uh, an interesting issue around driving. We're often asked what we advise and, and essentially at 5.5 centimetres, people can still drive. Um, it's only really when aneurysms are above six that we are told to advise them to refer to DVLA and they will be told not to drive. Um, all patients with an abnormal scan, so that's over three centimetres, will be given an appointment to speak with our nurse Liz or the equivalent um, on the southeast London side to have a sort of general cardiovascular advice checkup where we'll talk about issues around driving, flying holidays and just general health, particularly stopping smoking, which is very key in terms of aneurysm development. Next slide, please. This is just some numbers. So if we we started this program, um, we were one of the first centres to start this back in 2009. We've now got over 600 people in our surveillance program. So 600 people around South London with aneurysms that we know about, and we're monitoring those. And these are the sort of numbers, only around seven approaching surgery, but 39 it won't be far off behind and approaching 600 that have small aneurysms. And they're very low risk at this sort of size. Next slide, please. What does this lead to? Well, the national figures are quite impressive. We've now in 10 years had over 2 million people invited and 1.5 million screened with a, just over 4,000 aneurysms repaired electively. And when we think of aneurysm ruptures having a mortality of 70 to 80 percent, the mortality from elective surgery is, is just over 1 percent now. So you can see the advantages of this for men whose aneurysms are detected early, repaired electively, they have a much better outcome. Next slide, please. In terms of South London, we managed to invite almost all. There are obviously a few that slip through the net, as with all screening programmes, and we've got around a, just approaching 70% uptake, which is not bad for a, for a London setting. One in 100 will be abnormal, and we've now repaired over 200 aneurysms in South London from the screening programme and it's picking up. So because the surveillance is exponential and we'll pick more and more up that'll grow and to reach the size of repair, things have been busy over the last year. So we've had um, around 50 odd patients since July 2020 uh, having surgery from this programme across South London. And that's continued despite COVID quite interesting, especially through the second phase. Uh, next slide, please. There are some that aren't fit for surgery, and these will pop up occasionally, I'm sure, in your patient groups. And that's a difficult decision sometimes. We have to balance the risk of elective surgery against the risk of rupture, accepting that rupture has a very high mortality. But sometimes in sick patients, elective surgery also comes with higher risk. Those we operate on in South London have the best results in the country, less than 1% mortality. And we do have data on those that we delay or perhaps put a higher threshold on um, to show that the, res that the results are probably appropriate in terms of our decision making. But it's often difficult because it is involves a lack of a loss of independent, a loss of de independence if they lose their driving license, for example. So sometimes a difficult decision, but not many are uh, don't receive their surgery. Uh, next slide, thanks. So just to finish. Um, this is if you look uh, online and search, you can find the referral process. It's easy to find. There is a self referral process so you can guide people in this direction. As I say, all men at 65 should receive an invitation. We know uh, uh, the, the majority do receive their invitations, but they can self refer. And again, you can find this on this website or just by searching aneurysm screening South London, you'll find this. Next slide, thanks. And this is just our contact details, but again, easy to find online, so I don't think I need to dwell on this. Thank you.
Thank you. We're running slightly over, but that's fine. So I'm going to hand over to Liz and Matt now. I don't know who's going first. We can. Uh, Liz is going to go first, I think. Uh, yeah, it's going to be me. Um, thank you. Uh, so I'm the um, aortic CNS at, at St George's, and and as Ian has said, when the AAA is identified, then we work hard to modify uh, at risk factors for the patient. Um, so we're looking really at uh, smoking, so smoking cessation or support to, to give up. Um, patients ideally should be on a statin, um, antiplatelet drug, um, and should have good blood pressure control. And if these could be started in primary care, then that would uh, be very helpful. Uh, next slide, please. So the end is Already said, um, I have a screening program uh, clinic. It's telephone at the moment. Um, and that is um, for all patients who've had a positive screen for an aneurysm or for people who have a larger aneurysm over four and a half centimetres and um, are having screening every three months. Uh, or patients can also request to have an appointment with me if they wish. Um, it's a 20 minute appointment. Um, as I've said at the moment, it is over the phone, but um, Patients can have a face-to-face -face appointment if they need. Next slide, please. So for the uh, telephone clinic, um, the screening office obtained the GP records in advance um, so that I can see the patient's past medical history, their medication, um, and a recent set of observations. Uh, it's a chance to give the patient a little bit of information about the aneurysm to find out what their understanding is. Um, and to give them an opportunity to ask questions. Um, it's also another opportunity to look at their smoking history and refer them for smoking cessation if needed, uh, to check if they're on a statin antiplatelets and, and what their blood pressure is doing. Um, and I write to the GP after with a, a summary of our conversation. Um, and if the patient perhaps needs to start a statin or, or uh, antiplatelet, Ooh. Sorry, I'm back again. Uh, put a request in for the patient to uh, make an appointment with the GP to discuss that. Next slide, please. So I also have uh, a preoperative um, assessment clinic. Um, and when the aneurysm is at threshold, as we've said, at 55 millimetres, uh, when they're being considered for treatment, then they're booked into my optimization clinic, which is a one stop clinic uh, that runs once a week at Queen Mary's in Roehampton. And at this pre op assessment, um, every patient has a CT uh, aorta, they have a transthoracic echo and ECG. For those patients who are being considered for open or complex <clears throat> repair, then uh, they have a butamine stress echo. They all have uh, lung function tests, carotid and popliteal artery uh, duplex scan. Uh, we do a full set of bloods um, and I clock and examine the patient. Next one, please. Um, so we, I talk to the patients a lot and their relatives, of course, about um, pre-op uh, preparation. We talk about what to expect during the operation, what the admission to hospital uh, will be like. Um, we have to talk about COVID and the, you know, that sort of the preparation for that. Um, they're also given instructions um, as to their medication, what uh, medication to perhaps hold um, before their surgery. Talk also about their post-op recovery and what that might be like, um, what the post-op surveillance would be for their operation. Um, and also talk about setting expectations for their length of stay. So we're trying very hard to reduce the length of stay, particularly for EVA, um, down to 24 hours or less. And so it's really just putting the patient into the right mindset for that. Um, and so that they can make proper arrangements uh, so that they would be able to go home within 24 hours. And of course, giving the patient opportunity to ask any questions that they might have about uh, the surgery. Once all the results are available uh, from this assessment, then I bring the case to the St George's um, MDT um, and together we make a plan for the patient's treatment. Um, Thanks. That's, I think that's Matt's slide. Thank you. <laughs> so hi, my name's Matt. I'm one of the physios at St Thomas's. Um, I suppose going forward from that, we're, 
that we have we do have slightly different setups at St Thomas's and St George's, but really the the overarching principle is the same. It's a, a one stop clinic if possible, or face to face or virtual, depending on the situation at the moment. Um, but it's MDT, and the idea is to encourage that healthy lifestyle, um, and uh, set some expectation management and really work on increasing their fitness through through exercise if possible alleviating the fears around that so if we look at the patients the vascular patients tend to be older and frailer more comorbid less fit and we know they're going to undergo surgical stress um, next slide please Elsie um, and we know from the literature that impaired functional capacity basically means that you'll probably have worse outcomes after um, and in this group as well. Um, so improving their fitness should improve their post-operative outcomes um, and that's the premise I suppose behind prehabilitation. Uh, next slide. Um, there has been some work in this group as well so we know that it works in uh, aortic patients. Systematic review here from 2014 included 21 trials with over 1300 patients so this this was all prehab, not just um, a work, I should say, but physical function, reduced, uh, improved physical function, improved uh, their length of stay and reduced their complications. Uh, next slide again. And in the AAA literature, even as far back in the VAR2 study in, in 2005, they were talking about vascular teams should be focusing on techniques to try and improve patient fitness before undergoing the surgery. Um, we know that patients undergoing a six week exercise program can increase their anaerobic threshold um, and the um, the paper by Baccarat, their six weeks training program for patients undergoing AAA surgery reduced their post of cardiac, respiratory and renal complications as well as their length of stay um, without increasing any um, risks significantly. Next slide. Um, in the our patient group, we um, instigated a questionnaire prior to doing some prehab with some patients um, and you can see that there was a bit of a gap in how much um, exercise or the, their concerns around the exercise before surgery. So 49% of them said they had no concerns, um, but more than half said they did have concerns around it. Um, and this group here, which is small, but were patients that have been told by their primary care physician not to do anything. So they'd been advised not to do any exercise there. So there is this gap. Um, so in uh, both organisations, I think that the target population is this AAA group. Um, they get medical optimization from POPs and anaesthetic, which I'm sure Jude will talk about. Um, and both groups get a uh, up to two hour workshop basically it's online at the moment it was face to face um, and I expect it will move back that, that way. Um, the St Thomas's one is focused on AAA disease whereas the St George's one is more generic surgery but the outcomes are the same I think we're trying to encourage people to get as fit as possible before their surgery to reduce the risks. Um, and at the St Thomas's one, and I imagine at the St George's one as well, there is a, an, an actual uh, exercise section to that where we try and get them up and get them involved in some exercise on the day, get them moving. Lots of it is around education on aneurysm and stuff. There's also a little bit about um, expectation around, even for the EVAR patients, you know, the surgeons in best will in the world will tell them it's two little cuts in the groin and I think we're just a little bit more realistic that they'll probably be quite painful cuts in the groin so take your analgesia get moving as quickly as possible. Uh, next slide please. Um, and the patient feedback's been really good so um, they've said it builds their confidence makes them feel part of the procedure they can do some more positive thinking information builds confidence again it was all easy to understand and helpful and it's been very helpful in their recovery. So I suppose that leads us on to Jude and patients not to treat. <laughs> thank you, Matt, and thanks for inviting me. Um, next slide, thank you. So 
we, we know and we've heard already from the um, data on who we screen that in the main patients with aortic aneurysms are older. Next slide, thank you. And we know, of course, that as we get older, it's not just age and years that we accumulate, but we have age related physiological change across all organ systems. So in terms of our renal physiology, in terms of our cardiorespiratory physiology, in terms of our cerebral physiology. We know that we accumulate other conditions, so we see higher numbers of patients who are older with multimorbidities or two or more comorbid conditions. And we also know that as we get older, we accumulate geriatric syndromes, so things such as cognitive problems or frailty or the propensity to develop delirium. Thanks, Elsie. Next slide. And we know in the perioperative literature that it's these three things, it's age-related physiological change, it's um, the accumulation of multimorbidity and it's geriatric syndromes, which consistently predict adverse perioperative outcome. And across the board in different surgical procedures, we see that it tends to be medical perioperative complications that are causing problems in older patients as opposed to surgical specific complications. Next slide, thank you. And again, thanks. And of course, that makes the selection of patients, as we've already heard, very important. So um, I'm sure the audience are aware of the International Choosing Wisely programme promoting shared decision making, um, using information from health professionals and patients to make the right decisions for patients. And of course, to do that well and make the right decisions for our patients, we do really need to consider patient related outcomes when we're looking at studies. So a real move in the in the um, literature away from simply mortality, which is, of course, important to patients, but also considering some of those things which matters touched on. So what will I be able to do after my surgery? Am I going to be independent? Will I require a care package, etc.? Next slide. Thank you. And so, as Matt has said at GSTT, um, through the POP service, we use preoperative comprehensive geriatric assessment and optimization. And this is exactly as it says, but it is an established and evidence based methodology. So we know that this process of comprehensively assessing a patient and then treating what we find through a multidisciplinary approach has got data in medical patients and you're more likely to be alive and living in your own home at 18 months after a single CGA if you're a medical patient. We see in, a, in emergency surgery through hip fracture studies that there's a similar picture if you have preoperative CGA prior to your hip surgery. And we've also looked at this in our elective vascular group at Guy's and St Thomas's, showing that in those patients who underwent comprehensive geriatric assessment and optimization, as opposed to standard care, they were in hospital for fewer days, predominantly due to fewer perioperative medical complications. Next slide, thank you. And so what actually happens when we go through this process of CGA and optimization before surgery? This is just looking at the last 500 patients, not just vascular, that had gone through the clinic. You see that there's a median of nine interventions per patient with a lot of new diagnoses being made. So a lot of this multimorbidity, which patients may have accumulated, being uncovered, new diagnoses being made. And then quite a lot of optimization of medications, both in terms of modifying perioperative risk, but also in terms of long term risk. So hopefully the patient not only gets over their aneurysm surgery without complication, but they then get useful added years as a result of good long term condition management. Some of the patients saw our occupational therapist and you see there that 15% of the patients coming through our service are turned down for surgery. So this is not just aneurysms, but across the board. Um, next slide, thank you. And then we were looking in this cohort at what, what are the characteristics of the patients who are turned down for surgery in the process of shared decision making between surgeons, anaesthetists, therapists, us as POPs and the patient and their family. And unsurprisingly, you're more likely to not undergo an operative procedure, but to have a conservative approach if you're frail, if you've got cognitive impairment or if you have a significant life limiting other condition. Next slide, Elsie. And this is looking at a cohort of patients from 2016 who um, had aortic aneurysms um, presented electively and were managed non-operatively, so turned down for aneurysm surgery. And again, unsurprisingly, in the turn down cohort, they were more likely to have significant renal disease, cardiac disease or prior cerebrovascular disease. 
And interestingly, because of course we all want to be not operating on the right patients and operating on the ones who will benefit, we see that the one year aneurysm mortality in this group who were turned down was 7% and actually they were dying from other causes. So 21% um, all cause mortality with a third of patients dying at one year after they'd presented a consideration for aneurysm surgery actually dying of cancer. So again, as was alluded to earlier, hopefully we are turning down the right patients. Next slide. And so these models of care we see from national surveys that we've conducted are increasing. With respect to our local network, we operate POPS type services that use CGA methodology at Guy's and St Thomas's, at Darrant Valley Hospital and at Kent and Canterbury. But there's a real move for this to um, be rolled out nationally and we've got an NHS elect programme to do this at the moment. Next slide. And of course, that very much involves um, colleagues in primary care. So this is um, some work that we'd done um, with um, general practitioners nationally, looking at their role in how to optimise people so that we get the right patients coming forward with the right flow of information. And although we commonly hear at conferences, well, you know, this is general practice, CGA is just general practice. Actually, we're very cognizant of the fact that we have the luxury of more time in our outpatient clinic. And so it is easier for us to do these kinds of things in adequate detail. And actually what our GP colleagues were telling us nationally is that the, the surgical patients are actually very low frequency in terms of their workload. They have minimal interaction with perioperative services and actually minimal training in that. And so we have developed um, a national guideline between the British Geriatric Society and the Centre for Perioperative Care looking at frailer older patients presenting for elective and emergency surgery and how we can properly look after these patients across the pathway. So from initial conception of surgery, whether that's in primary care or through an emergency presentation, right through to surgery or no surgery and then care back in the community. So this guideline is um, due to be published later this month. Um, and very much was developed with um, Royal College of GP um, involvement to try and improve those transitions of care um, and make the, make the pathway um, slicker for patients who may not need an operation. I think just as a final thought, um, we're working on looking at our turndowns at the moment and what we probably haven't got right yet across the network is how we document that so that everybody is aware both general practice but also palliative care teams in the community and then vascular teams who are on call at night who has been turned down and what happens in the event of aortic rupture so I think that's something that we can improve on and that's work going forward. Thank you. Somewhat amazingly, we're running very on time, so we're going to have plenty of time for questions unless Mr Loftus answers all of them in the chat beforehand. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Professor Peter Holt now, who's going to do post-surgery follow-up and then back to Matt for recovery. OK, thank you very much. Um, if you can just move on to the next slide, thanks. So um, I'm just going to touch on these few things. I'm not going to try and present any new data, really. Um, this is where you are going to probably come into contact with the patients almost more than we are in the first few days or weeks after surgery. And in complete juxtaposition to what you've just heard about patients getting older, increasing comorbidity and um, you know, geriatric medical syndromes, there's also, as you know, a huge pressure to use our resources in different ways. And one of the ways we have to do that is to reduce length of stay. This is both preoperatively with patients coming in on the day of surgery that's very established now. And really that is a function of good preoperative assessment that they're able to come in on the day of surgery. Um, I think when patients is, are at the older end of the age group, we still try and bring them in the day before. I think bringing in someone in their mid to late eighties at seven in the morning for surgery is, is not always a good idea. Um, but it's post-operatively where we've seen the biggest changes. So if you look at the trial data, uh, patients with aneurysms, whether treated by open repair or EVAR, uh, had around a five to seven day length of stay. And now we're performing endovascular repair with day case surgery or maximally as overnight stay. So they'll come in in the morning and if they're done first on the list, they may well get home that evening or um, if they're done later in the day, they'll go home the following morning. 
And for an open aneurysm repair, the length of stay anticipated would be four to five days. So that's come down as well, although clearly it's slightly longer than uh, endovascular repair. We're trying to back up uh, this early discharge to the community with telephone calls at around 48 hours post discharge to try and see off any problems or concerns that patients might have because we have done some modeling around when patients bounce back to hospital and it tends to be at about the 48 hour mark and as we've just heard in previous talks it's very rarely anything to do with the surgical procedure but it, it's medical problems or just general anxiety around the procedure um, and we know we can reduce this by, by staying in touch with the patients. And there are a number of ways we're doing this, but, but one way is with a phone call of around 48 hours. But inevitably, this does mean that some patients are going to access primary care, um, perhaps rather than accessing the hospital or, or, or rather than coming back to the emergency department. So what do we expect in the first few days uh, and first few weeks after an aneurysm repair? And this just depends really what type of repair you've had. Quite often, irrespective of the type of repair, patients feel tired, they're a bit uncomfortable, even if they've had a, a percutaneous endovascular repair. If they've had an open repair or a complex or uh, fenestrated graft for a juxtarenal aneurysm, often they may have a loss of appetite. Um, and this can last for, for some days to some weeks after the repair, out, out to around six weeks when we see them in clinic. If you've had a fenestrated graft, the patient may well say, I'm just exhausted, I'm sleeping all the time, I can't eat. And this doesn't mean anything's gone wrong. It's just something that we see, and, and it's a matter of reassuring the patient. And um, you know, sometimes we get a scan to, to make sure there aren't any problems if they've got any other symptoms with it. But normally it's just a matter of reassuring them and it's the expected course. After endovascular repair in particular, and something that you may see with this earlier discharge is in the first 48 hours after surgery, patients can get some quite significant temperatures up to about 40 degrees. And this tends to be uh, overnight. It can be quite a swinging type of fever. And often people think patients are infected, and in fact they're not, or very rarely are they infected. This is what's called the post-implantation syndrome, and it's where you put a stent graft in and the aneurysm sac is thrombosing off, and they get these big spikes of temperature. But they should settle after around the first 48 hours. If they're persistent after 48 hours, then we need to consider that there might be something else going on and see the patient, do some blood tests and potentially start some antibiotics. In some patients, the post-implantation syndrome can go on for several days, more than that 48 hour period, but uh, really the majority settle after around 48 hours. So with EVAR, we don't really expect much in the way of complications, uh, particularly as they're largely percutaneous now. So there's not much in the way of a wound to get infected or dehiss, but some patients will have a cut down in the groin. And uh, if they were to uh, get a swollen groin or the incision in the groin were to start to break down, then clearly that's something we want to know about because there might be a false aneurysm or there might be uh, infection, infection brewing in the groin. This is something that, depending on whether the patient's unwell or not, could be managed through refer a patient or through kinesis. So if you're not sure about the wound, we'd be happy to, if you could take a photo and send it through and refer a patient, we can look at the photo and we can make a decision as to whether that patient then needs to come to accident emergency or back to the hospital for further assessment or whether they can be managed locally. And many of the groin complications can be managed locally. For open aneurysm repair, really the problems are those same problems of any laparotomy. So bowel obstruction, wound dehiscence, pain, urinary retention. So the usual things after, uh, after major surgery. And unlike EVA, patients who have had open aneurysm repair are significantly more prone to DVT and PE. So if someone's had uh, an aortic repair and get a big swollen leg, then of course um, that'd be something we would be very concerned about or if they're short of breath, then we want to see them 
sooner rather than later to make an assessment as to whether they've got a DVT or PE. Those are really quite rare with, with EVAR. Um, of course, it can still happen, but, uh, but it's not something that happens commonly. So they're the sorts of things we, we want to know about or can go wrong in the first few weeks. Later on, there are other complications that can happen. And uh, for open repair in particular, the thing we worry about is graft infection and graft fistula formation. So an aortoenteric fistula. And these can present very acutely. So if you have an enteric fistula, you can present with significant hematemesis or they can be quite insidious with an anemia forming over a period of time or a graft infection, swinging temperatures, indicative of essentially abscess formation in the abdomen. And if someone's had a, an open aneurysm repair in the past, and it can be many years in the past, of, of course, and, and that um, so it doesn't always uh, spring to mind as being the first problem. If someone's had an aortic repair, then we need to know about it if they're getting temperatures or there's a significant unexplained anemia. And we tend to bring them in for, for a CT scan, blood tests, blood cultures, and um, unfortunately both graft infection and fistula formation have a very high morbidity and mortality associated with them. Um, so the so things we can treat more easily if we find out about them early, uh, but they, they do tend to, don't always spring to mind uh, first off of the graft repair was, was many years ago. With endovascular repair, we're more worried about endo leak. So this is where there's a leak around the graft into the aneurysm, and that can predispose to secondary rupture of the aorta. And that can happen at any point but down the line, but tends to happen uh, the further away you get from the initial repair. And because of that, patients with, an with EVAR uh, undergo surveillance. So they have ultrasound surveillance from the time they're discharged from hospital. They have a couple of scans in the first year, and then after a period, they end up on, on once a year scans. And this is to look at the aneurysm size and also to see whether there's an endo leak that's forming. And most endo leaks these days we can, uh, can treat, not all need treating, but most endo leaks have a way of treating them uh, to fix that leak and prevent secondary aneurysm rupture. One caveat to that is some patients may have had an EVAR 10 years ago when they're in their 70s and they're now in their mid 80s and the scale of procedure required to fix an endo leak may simply be too great uh, because revisional aortic surgery carries a significant risk and in some patients as we we're hearing before we might make a decision not to treat an endo leak and yes that predisposes the patient to potential rupture in the future but that might be a lesser risk than undertaking uh, a complex revisional aneurysm repair. And the final thing I just wanted to, to touch on was quality of life. And one of the issues with aneurysms is that unless they rupture, they're asymptomatic. And particularly in the early months after surgery, patients can have a reduction in quality of life, particularly after open repair, because they do have a laparotomy wound, painful wounds, they've got reduced mobility, um, they may have this tiredness, reduction in appetite and so on. And so that to a degree is expected, the patient's quality of life after a successful repair may be lower objectively to them than, uh, than it was before the operation. What we do know is that after a period of months, this returns to baseline and uh, in particular, the anxiety around aneurysm and the ri risk of aneurysm rupture goes away. And uh, that, that's important for understanding um, why aneurysm repair is important to patients beyond preventing rupture, because they do have significant anxiety in some cases around the effect of the, on the quality of life, their limitations on what they can do and anxiety related to that. OK, so yeah, I think that's me. So over to you, Matt. Sorry, was on mute. Um, I suppose this is a, a, a really simplified overview of post-op recovery, um, but it pretty much indicates what we do. So the day after their surgery, try and get patients up, moving, mobile as much as possible, much 
assess their chest but I would say in the vast majority of these patients chest complications just don't exist um, if they do going on from that the next couple of days we would try and just work on their secretion clearance um, if it's identified as a risk and we narrow two needs but really it's about just progressing their mobility getting them back to a level where they can get home and they feel comfortable and confident being at home um, if they need a stairs assessment we would do one that would come out in the assessment if their bedroom and bathroom are upstairs for instance that kind of thing just making sure as people were saying people are confident about being at home and comfortable with it um, and we can make onwards referrals to community physio community ot those kind of things if patients need it when when they're discharged um, more complex repairs open repairs longer icu stays when things go wrong obviously that rehab recovery period is going to be longer um, and, and a bit more complex but generally we're just trying to slowly pace their return back to some form of normality with their mobility next slide please and once they're discharged I, i've kept this really simple because i'm assuming from a GP point of view, what you want to know is what to tell the patient when they come in. And it's really just trying to encourage your patients to return to their previous activities. Their aneurysm has been fixed and what they want to do is a graded return to that activity. So if someone normally plays golf, has an EVAR done, complex EVAR, simple EVAR, and then thinks they're going to go around and do 18 holes, walk the golf course the next week, they're probably going to be knackered. They're going to find it really hard. They might just want to go to the driving range or the putting green for a, for a couple of weeks and work back into it, that kind of thing. So it's, it's, it's just about trying to do slow, steady increases, get people out and about, get them going for a walk. Um, if they can go for what they consider a brisk walk, there's been some work that's shown that that's kind of at an exercise level. So, uh, if they are a bit short of breath and a bit breathy, that's fine as long as they're not panting and getting chest pain. You know, though their body has undergone a stress, they will be a little bit, their fitness will have taken a bit of a hit. So it's just a case of getting them out, getting them up slowly but surely. So if they got a big garden, they can do lengths of the garden. If they can go out and walk up and down the street a couple of times, great. If they've got a park nearby, encourage them to go from one bench to another. It's just about getting people doing a slow and steady return to what they were doing normally. Um, if they need a community physio referral, we'll do one. But it's, it, again, in this patient population for the EVAL patients is really rare. Some of the open patients a bit more. Um, but I think that's about it really, unless there's any questions on that. Okay, well, next slide. Well, I'm going to give a big congratulations to all the speakers for speaking very much on time in what can only be, des um, be described as a surprise to me. Um, <laughs> so we now actually have the full 20 minutes, which I didn't expect for questions, and we don't seem to have a flood of them. Um, so unfortunately, Mr Loftus, despite answering it, but for the benefit of the people that are going to watch it online, and we do actually have quite normally quite a few people watching them online, um, I'm going to make you answer the question on why women aren't part of the national screening program and what to tell people when their husbands or partners are, are called up for screening and they're not. That's OK. Yes, sorry, I was sort of preempting things and uh, answering in real time. Um, so it's quite controversial for screening women, but of course everything in the NHS is done on a cost effectiveness analysis, especially with screening. Um, they go through a very long and detailed process to get screening programmes approved. And um, 15 years ago it was deemed that for women it simply wasn't cost effective because aneurysms in women are far less common. Um, the genetics of that are complex but it's around an eightfold difference so simply to run a screening program for the numbers of aneurysms we pick up in women over 65 it, it just wouldn't be worthwhile uh, also not cost effective now it is um, something that's discussed on a regular basis internationally and indeed Sweden have a bit of a push to screen for women who smoke because actually women who smoke are probably around the same risk as men who have never smoked. So one could argue that they should be incorporated into the screening program, but of course that then becomes a very complex screening program to run. So 
the, the bottom line is women are excluded. Women can't self-refer into the national programme. They are completely excluded. Um, but I think there is a role for ultrasound scans in women who are anxious who smoke, but particularly women who um, have a family history. So if you have a family history of aneurysmal disease, your risk as a woman becomes that much higher that actually then it is well worth looking. And we recommend a one-off ultrasound, usually in the 50s actually, if there's a strong family history, because that would suggest some sort of genetic disorder, perhaps a connective tissue disorder that may not be diagnosed. Um, and if that's normal, maybe 10 years later. But certainly at 65 with a family history, I, I would suggest women should have a one-off ultrasound. But again, that has to be out with of the screening programme. I hope that makes sense. It does. OK, um, but I don't know who best to address this TXC question, so I'm going to leave it to whoever in the, on the panel would like to put their head off the parapet. Oh, Pete, there you go. I'll have, a, I'll have a stab at it. So, so it, it's um, it's not it's not controversial, but I suppose it's up in the air what the the answer is. I, I think increasingly on the background of the trauma data, there, then it is being provided in ruptures. Uh, there is a theoretical possibility of causing vessel thrombosis, uh, but we don't necessarily see that. Some people do ruptured aneurysms off. Um, off heparin um, and again that's that's debatable as whether you should do that or not because it leads to vessel thrombosis. I think more and more particularly with an open rupture um, it would be given uh, with an EVAR where you don't have the same volume of blood loss uh, perhaps not. And I suppose in some ways that, that some ways that leads into the question around about permissive uh, hypotension as well and, and resuscitation. Um, so permissive hypotension comes from the trauma data. Uh, and in fact, the trial data around ruptured aneurysms suggests there is a negative effect to a degree of permissive hypotension, but that hasn't been strong enough for people to stop practicing it. So you're more likely to get renal problems post-operatively if you survive, if you've had a very low blood pressure. But it's possible that you may be more likely to get to surgery if you've had permissive hypotension. So perhaps, they, perhaps those two things balance out. Um, ultimately, if you have a ruptured aneurysm and have arrested, as in a not a faint but a proper arrest your likelihood of survival is incredibly poor and most surgeons would not go ahead with surgery so if you've had a cardiac arrest um certainly i wouldn't go ahead with surgery and i know ian's the same yeah there's very good data on this now if you've had an arrest and you've needed cpr certainly your chance of survival is zero um pretty pretty close to zero um so i agree with pete actually interesting i mean i think the issue around tranexamic acid again as pete said into is is all of the evidence really is in trauma and um the the recommendations now are for ruptured aneurysms is to go for an endovascular approach so a keyhole approach under local anesthetic and often if you get to theatre, the bleeding is contained. There's often a contained rupture, so there's not particularly active bleeding. And you can get very quick control of what bleeding there is by percutaneous puncture under local anaesthetic and getting a balloon into the aorta and stopping the bleeding. And as Pete's alluding to, actually then it's a problem of thrombosis sometimes, so we don't want to encourage thrombosis. Actually, sometimes we do give heparin which sounds rather perverse, but actually sometimes that's more preferable to uh, actually getting thrombosis of stents and of the vessels that we're trying to fix. Perfect. OK, so we've got a kind of referring question. How do you refer a patient who's had a repair outside the region into your service for follow up and ongoing review in the COVID world? So I assume they now live within the southeast or southwest vascular network catchment area we don't need lots of follow-ups and far away. Um, so 
that I would assume by both sites and as network manager it would just be if it's an outpatient appointment or a scan you put in a request via ARS or Kinesis to say this is the situation and then someone can properly direct you. I'm going to say so I don't have any answer to accessing physical and exercise therapy but Matt looks off me <laughs> engaged to answer that as our video so I will hand over to him. Um, yeah I think it depends on what you're um, trying to access the physio and exercise therapy for. Is it someone that's had a, a an operation very recently outside of network but is now coming in um, or is it someone that had a, a repair a long time ago and is just generally unfit um, or wants to get fitter um, or is it someone that's pre-op so if it's pre-op they would go through the same process basically you'd refer them in and then once they were in the system they would come to the pre-operative assessment process um, if it's post-op and they're just somebody who is generally frail or is having falls you could refer them to community physiotherapy or strength and balance class those kind of things which you should all have access to um, if it's somebody who is fixed and just wants to get fitter there are things like exercise on prescription or just local groups there's for one for instance there's one in Lewisham like a Nordic walking group and those kind of things which are just more kind of um, community accessed I'm not sure that that answers all of it but as a general you can refer into musculoskeletal physio community physio or exercise on prescription or just general exercise advice and community access great thank you matt we've got a question about post-surgical anemia settle how quickly should that happen and so i missed the, the, the key word there uh who wants to take that on I don't mind. Uh, I mean, it's quite slow is the honest answer. Um, I mean, usually with endovascular repair, blood loss is fairly minimal. Ruptures are completely different. We try to keep people at a reasonable hemoglobin level, but it is quite a slow process and goes back to what Matthew's saying. It's quite a long recovery sometimes from these things. Three to six months, actually, in some cases, and I've seen anemia take longer to correct itself. So occasionally a bit of iron and a bit of uh, medical support is necessary. But I, I, I do think sometimes these things take quite a long time to settle. Have I missed a question or was that the last one? There's one on intramural thrombosis, which is a really good question because Pete and I have a particular interest in this. Well, now you've obviously volunteered, so that's perfect. And it is really difficult. So it's actually a topic that we're researching at the moment. Um, I mean, there are different types of intramural thrombosis so without wanting to complicate it every case i think has to be treated in its own sort of right um and daniel you mentioned kinesis if there's ever if you never if you're ever just not sure just pop us a message and we'll have a look at imaging and see there's intramural hematoma which is a, perhaps a slightly different thing which is perhaps linked to aortic dissections and a whole group of syndromes there also where you get thrombosis within the lumen of the aorta or blood vessels sometimes mesenteric vessels and again they're quite complex and and we treat people differently often don't need any intervention particularly if they're asymptomatic but certainly sometimes need an eye keeping on if it's thrombus within the aorta i.e. thrombus that's forming in a slightly tatty or atherosclerotic or perhaps ectatic aorta, often nothing required at all other than perhaps aspirin or, or, a, or a similar antiplatelet agent. But I, I, it's a really good question because it's a very complex area and I think honestly if you're unsure contact one of us and we'll have a look. We don't necessarily need to see the patient but we can look at imaging and advise on individual cases. Perfect. So um, I'm going to double check, no one's put in a final question. Um, so Elsie has very helpfully put in the feedback form into the chat. Um, for some of you latecomers, um, you have to do the feedback form and put your email address at the bottom for me to send you the certificate of attendance after I got told off um, after a previous event, sending it to nearly 100 people that had signed up but all didn't attend. So please do the feedback form and you'll get there. Also really important the feedback form does uh, tell us what works well in these events and helps us learn and grow and make the events more interactive and uh, more engaging for you. And there is a question on there about what other topics you'd like to hear from 
um, particularly the vascular network, which I manage, but also the wider cardiovascular network. So the cardiac OGN and the cardiac surgery um, provider collaborative for South London. So if you have any things that come up a lot or anything specific you'd like further kind of webinars on, please put that in the suggest uh, in the question box and we can help inform what we offer as the year goes on um, at, at, as we look to kind of build that program. So uh, we'll kind of with some time to spare, which is very nice in a, on a Wednesday evening. Um, it just leaves me to thank all of our speakers for giving up their time. Uh, uh, Professor uh, Loftus and Holt had to run from surgery to get back home to do it, so that's very appreciated. And I can see Jude and, uh, Jude and Matt are still in the hospital, so I hope they get home soon as well. And thank you to Mr. Dialanis, Liz uh, as well, for giving up their time and giving a kind of real multidisciplinary team perspective on how we treat abdominal aortic aneurysms. And also, as Jude and Peter have often said, how, we, how sometimes we don't treat them and why. Um, so hopefully you found this helpful. Please do your feedback form and um, I'm going to sign off now. So thank you very much for giving up your evening. They've all gone. Where have they all gone? Hey.